All right, Trinity Church, how are you doing today? You guys look great. That was so fun <clears throat> seeing these kids uh, be dedicated. It's parents who are saying, God, we want to raise kids the way you want them raised, to love you and live lives that are pleasing to you. All those families are from the same home group, and we thought that was a really cool dynamic, too, of families just kind of living in community and, and having babies at the same time. That's all good stuff, so... <laughs> But we're really glad that you're here with us today. We continue in a series uh, looking at John chapters 5 through 10. And like the video shows, we're seeing this thing happen. We're seeing people as they're interacting with Jesus. The crowds are becoming more confused today. They're going to get really confused. And that's actually going to lead to unbelief. <clears throat> we'll see Jewish religious leaders, however, move way past confusion, unbelief to antagonism, and even becoming adversarial. And this is what's happening. But all along, Jesus is revealing himself to be the Messiah that for so many of us believe him to be. And we're going to keep tracking that as we walk through. If you have a Bible today, you want to make your way to John chapter 7 by the time, or 6, I'm sorry. By the time we're done with this series, we'll have done five messages just in this chapter alone. There's so much going on. But John chapter 6, if you want to make your way there. If you have our app, you can open that up to our notes section under resources and be able to track with us along that way as well. Well, a couple of things for you. We have been talking since a week and a half ago about an event that we're hosting tonight called an event for praise and prayer for you for Trinity Church. Many of you were either here in person or you were watching online um, to our church assessment, uh, survey assessment that came a few weeks ago. And our goal is to say, God, there's stuff among us that needs to get worked out. Would you bring us together so that we might be a people who are looking to you and looking to be reconciled to one another? So originally, when the weather was looking like it would be a beautiful night under the lights, we realized this morning, probably not going to be that kind of night. So we are going to move that event indoors. So it'll be here tonight, 7 p.m. Love for you to join us, and that'll really be the focus, is just being able to lift our voices to the Lord together and to be able to come together in prayer and ask God, God, would you do a work among us? The other thing that's going on that I want to remind you of, I want to put, I want you to put this date on your calendar. Some of you have a pocket calendar you literally have on your person right now. Get it out. Others of you keep it on an app, like a Google calendar or whatever you keep it on. I want you to get that out. I want you to put on there June the 27th. June the 27th. That is going to be our congregational meeting. We do that once a year. And as we are kind of anticipating and getting ready for that, we will be doing things like um, affirming our church budget, which we do on a, we're a July to June uh, fiscal year. And we have two of our elders that we're reaffirming, our chairman of our board, Dan Fleming, and our vice chairman of our board, Doug Richards. So we look forward to you being there for that. Everyone is welcome. Members will be able to vote. And it's going to be a big day in Trinity Church's story. So we'd love for you to make a point to be there that day. And we'll keep giving you more reminders along the way. But June the 27th, Sunday afternoon. All right, we're going to dive in today. Today what we're going to do is we're going to continue in the conversation that Jesus was having with the crowds. Now the religious leaders have kind of moved their way. You can imagine them almost moving their way to the front. And what's gone on from Jesus kind of confronting the crowds for seeking him primarily for free lunch part de is now he's actually having a conversation with religious leaders who are now becoming antagonistic. And so in that, we're going to watch that continue to unfold. But like I said last week, is that for if you're here and you have put your faith in Jesus, you don't identify primarily with the crowds nor the religious leaders who are antagonistic. You identify with his disciples. And so imagine as Jesus is sharing with the crowds, the disciples may be kind of sprung out here around the sides or sitting down close towards the front. Imagine you today as we're looking at this words, being at the feet of Jesus and hearing him talk about these things that I'm going to say from the beginning are going to be confusing. These are what we call some of the hard sayings of the Bible. But in it, what I want to call your attention to is what does that look like to be someone that when Jesus says hard things, how do you process that? And what do you keep doing? Look at our now what statement. This would be my goal. When you're confused by something that Jesus has said, keep going to the source for answers. When you're confused by something that Jesus says or does in Scripture, keep going to the source for answers. And that's what we're going to do together today. In your notes, number one, those who are drawn by the Father will believe in the Son. Those who are drawn by the Father will believe in the Son. We're in John chapter 6, verse 43. It says this, Jesus speaking, stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, 
and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. So as we're walking through, this is, in a lot of ways, kind of a restatement of what a lot of our, our time was looking at last week. Now remember, we have a whole week between last week's part of John 6 and this week's part. This was all in real time. So this is one ongoing conversation. So this isn't split up by a week to think and process. So Jesus is kind of repeating himself of just some themes that he laid out really clearly for us last week, and we got to spend some time kind of breaking down. Note that, though, when he says stop grumbling, he's not talking to the crowds, he's talking to the religious leaders, because they're the ones who are bringing up these kinds of questions, and that's where we finished last week, is they were grousing among themselves. Now, John uses this title, the Jews. We saw that very early in this book when we were looking in chapters one and two, and that, that phrase means the religious leaders of the Jewish party. And so... They begin to rise up, we'll see more and more today, in an adversarial manner against Jesus, rather than responding in the faith that he's calling them to. And we're going to see that really clearly today. Jesus provides an opportunity for everyone, the crowds, the religious leaders, and even his own disciples, to continue to lean in, to continue to follow him. But we're going to see reactions be different and scattered all over the place. Jesus summarizes briefly what he said last week. Only those who are drawn by the Father, whom the Spirit of God quickens. We spent some time talking about that last Sunday. The people in your relational world who've not yet put their faith in Jesus, it's not a matter of information at the end of the day. It's a matter of the fact that they're spiritually dead. And so God has to wake each and every one of us up. And that's who the, the Father is drawing. Then they can come to the Son in faith. And those that do, Jesus is going to raise up on the last day. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah. It's a paraphrase. And what's interesting in that quote is that um, whenever we look at a quote from the former covenant from the Old Testament, it's really important that we not only go back and look at the context, but often what it is, it's actually a small statement that means to infer the whole chapter or the whole passage. Let me give you an example. Often in the Psalms, the Psalms are very frequently quoted by Jesus and then by even some other New Testament writers. And often it will just be a line within a Psalm that has like 27 verses. And so the question is, does the, the writer intend to just draw your attention to that one brief phrase? And what we actually know is, no, he's actually drawing your attention to the whole. So it's important to go back and look at the whole passage. It'd be like in our culture today, there might be a time when someone says, you know, they'll be talking and they'll reference something and say, you know, like, for we the people. And when you hear that phrase, you, those three words don't mean much to you unless you know it relates to the preamble of our Constitution. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. Schoolhouse rock, it sticks, right? So... So when someone says, we the people, you actually know they actually are referring at least to the preamble, if not the whole constitution. So it's the same concept. So Jesus is saying these few words in reference to Isaiah 54. Look up on the screen. Is, this is what Isaiah 54, verse 13, the specific verse says, all your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. Psalm 54, the second half of Isaiah, or the last third, is Isaiah the prophet saying, God is done judging you. The times of challenge are over. We're moving into a new era. And that's what Psalm 54 is about. Look down to verse 17, a verse you know. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you this is the heritage, we've even prayed about that today, legacy and heritage within families. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. What Jesus is saying is that the prophet Isaiah forecasted, prophesied, that there would be a day when God the Father would teach people and they would respond. And this is what Jesus is saying, that day is among you. This is happening even as I speak, the Father teaches you, the Father draws you, and when he does, you believe in the Son. That's the relationship, even of the response of faith, is how the Father is at work calling people, drawing them, that they might believe in the Son. 
Jesus goes on to tell the crowds about this unique relationship he has that he's come down from the Father. And we remember back to John 3 that Jesus said something very, very similar to one singular member of the Jewish religious leaders. That was Nicodemus. Look at this verse. John 3, 13. He says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. He's referring to himself. So Jesus has used this language before with one religious leader. Now he's talking to a crowd of them and to the crowd in general, and he's using a very similar response. And we saw this from the very beginning of John's gospel, that this relationship, this unique relationship. You see, even when we go back and look at very unique people that God used, there's the only references I can even think of when anyone invoked this idea of God as father was David writing in the Psalms. And what we look at now is we realize he was talking about Jesus. Jesus having this unique, one-of-a-kind relationship. And here is the wild thing. When you and I talk about God as Father, the New Testament fleshes this idea out so powerfully that we are called his sons and daughters because of the Son. And what he does to make us right, to make it available for us to be acceptable, for us to be uh, in right relationship with our Creator, who we now get to call Papa. Papa. That's the wildness of the gospel. And so this one-of-a-kind, unique relationship that Jesus has with God, calls him his father, man, that's going to incense the religious leaders. They're going to go nuts over this, and not just now, but increasingly in the next couple chapters of John. Jesus tags onto this statement another summary of what he said, uh, what we looked at last week. What's expected, what's required of people that they might have eternal life is not more religion. Remember, that's what the people asked last week. What must we do to do the works of God? Jesus said it's not about doing, it's about believing. And there is an activeness to belief. It's not mental assent, but it's the idea that this is where it begins. Not more religion, but faith. That they would place their faith, their confidence in Jesus and begin to follow him. And as a result, what they would receive is eternal life. Now, I want to tell you something. If you've been in church a long time like me, and when I say things like believing Jesus for the hope, for the confidence that you would have eternal life, you have to know how silly that sounds. That's the stuff of storybooks and fairy tales and myths. That's the stuff of movies where someone's going to do this crazy sequence of things so that he might attain eternal life. (laughs) But here's the deal. You hear those stories and you watch those movies and you go, that's bunk. That's not how it happens. But the people in your relational world who haven't put their faith in Christ, they don't think it happens at all. They think the whole thing's bunk including what you believe. But you actually have a belief, you actually have a confidence that you will live forever around the throne of God. You have to know how weird that sounds to people. And even before you put your faith in Christ and you heard about other people who believed in eternal life, you're like, what? I don't know what happens when you die, but I don't know, I don't know what that's about. Here's the great thing. I want you to see this, and this comes because of, again, a a work that Jesus has done in you. Look in your notes. You believe that you and others who've also believed will have eternal life with Jesus forever. You believe that it isn't a fairy tale, but that it's your future. And I want to reinforce that today, both the, the truth of that, the confidence that should give you and I. That when we gather at events where we remember people who put their faith in Christ, that we should take to heart when Paul writes to the Thessalonian church, you mourn, but not like those who have no hope. You mourn because you're separated from them, but not because you'll never see them again. There's a pause. That's what this is. Between here and there, there's a pause that you're experiencing. They're not. I've said it so many times at memorial services for people that put their faith in Christ. Man, please don't grieve for them. They've never been better off. We grieve because of how much we miss them and that hole that that leaves in our lives. So Jesus is talking about real things about eternal life, and he means them, and he means for us to find confidence in them as well. 
And I think about how difficult this year has been. And I hope one of the effects of the challenges of a global pandemic has caused you all the more to lean forward and say, even so, Jesus, even so, come quickly. Bring us into what you've promised. This is what hard times do, is they make us hunger and thirst for heaven even more. And that's a good thing. Because we can easily become too comfortable and just think that this is what life was intended to be. The idea that belief is the source of eternal life is key to connect to the next words we're about to hear Jesus say. Number two in your notes, it's not that Jesus didn't say hard things, it's what you do with them that matters. It's not as though Jesus didn't say hard things, it's what you do with them that matters. John 6, verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But there is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now watch. Then the Jews began to argue. Again, the Jews. This is that group of religious leaders. Began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? What? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Huh? Man, if you can read those words and those don't cause you to be a little uncomfortable and a little bit, what? Then I'd like to meet you after this service because they sure cause that in me. I'm, I'm thinking in my head when I'm reading this passage this week to study, to get ready to talk to you today, I'm like, Lord, please help me be able to say something intelligible about this. Lord, please help me be able to communicate this in a way that doesn't sound as blech, What? Here's the wild thing. We'll look at in a minute what I believe Jesus is talking about. Here's the wild thing, though. It's important to know not only what he's saying, what it means, but to whom he's saying it. You see, if we were here today and we were talking about, you know, what's a, 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 a powerful strategy? What's a, an effective way to share the gospel with people who haven't yet put their faith in Christ? We would probably not say these words. <laughs> Come to Jesus, and it's all about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But can I tell you the wild thing? That's exactly who he's talking to. He is talking to the crowds who have not yet put their faith in him, who have not yet believed he is who he says he is. He's talking to religious leaders have, who have already written him off long before he says these. Huh. That's interesting. Jesus goes back and connects a dot to what he had said, what we looked at last week. He just said it a few moments ago in real time. We looked at it last week. And again, one of those I am statements, he actually says it two different ways. I am the bread of life and I am the living bread. But he's saying the same thing. And we said how powerful it is whenever Jesus says an I am because I am is the stated name of Yahweh. Moses cries out, who should I say sent me? I am. So this is a powerful thing that Jesus is invoking. And by the way, the religious leaders would not have missed it. We're going to see it again and again. And he says that this bread that he has come to give, it leads to eternal life. The bread that the father had given before to, his, to their ancestors in the desert, they ate it, but they died. It only added another day to mortality. And it never brought eternal life. This bread is different. It is something that is categorically different, categorically better, categorically more needful than anything that Moses could ever offer because Moses wasn't the Messiah, Jesus is. I want you to notice the words in what we just read. In just seven verses, six times we read the words life, live, or living. So this expression, this concept of being alive is very, very important in this part of the passage and is contrasted with death. 
And the way that they would receive this life would be partaking of his flesh. Now, commentators say that Jesus could have easily picked a much more benign word, like talking about his body. That would have been a much more like, oh, okay, you receive his body. No, it's really clear. It's a very intentional word. You must eat my flesh. It's the stuff you think of flesh, the stuff that hangs off your bones. But what's fascinating is this is not the first time that we've seen the word flesh in the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And what's powerful is, is to catch how Jesus links that concept. He tells them clearly what the purpose of him giving his flesh is for, which I will give for the life, another, that word used again, I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is communicating the way by which eternal life will be made available to sinners Sinners who are in need of saving is that he's going to offer himself, his body, his flesh in order to provide eternal life. Commentator David Guzik says this, Jesus Jesus explained that receiving him as bread was not receiving him as a great moral teacher, example, or prophet. It was not receiving him as a good or great man or noble martyr. It was receiving him in light of what he did on the cross his ultimate act of love for lost humanity. In order to receive eternal life, people must eat, people must be nourished, people must be connected to Jesus. Note that then this response, then the the religious leaders are there and they respond not just with with confusion, but now contention. They were sharply disagreeing among themselves. Remember that this morphed, this is more from Jesus confronting originally the crowds are only there for a free lunch and beginning to teach them about himself to now basically a conversation with this group of Jewish religious leaders that Jesus is talking to. And their response of not only not understanding but kind of moving further into a sense of contempt was actually shown again in that same conversation in John chapter 3 with one of their own, Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. This image in John 6 is even more, huh? But John 3 was really weird too. Born again? Look at his answer. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. And here's the thing. This isn't just confusion. Now it's a statement. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. He's being contentious. He's coming back at him like you're wrong. The Jewish leaders, singular in chapter 3, now group in chapter 6. That's exactly what they're saying. And I want you to hear me today say this. These words are not easy to just quickly understand or read them and go, okay, that makes sense. But I want you to see this week as well, look in your notes. These words were not meant to stump people. These words were not meant to stump them, but they were meant to sort them. They were not meant to stump them, but they were meant to sort them, to divide out those who were only thinking of another lunch from those who were genuinely seeking eternal life. That's what the intent, the purpose, and we'll see that in a moment, what these words are about. But here's one thing I want you to consider. It hit me like a ton of bricks a few years ago. What do you do when someone tells you something that is very bizarre? What, what do you do when that gets put out there in the air? Well, you do really one of three things. If the person who tells you something very bizarre, let's say at the workplace, and you're sitting there talking, have a conversation, they say something, you kind of go, huh, that's interesting. I'm going to go make some coffee. I'm just like, that was weird. If the person who tells you something very bizarre is someone you're already kind of wanting to create distance, now you have a great excuse. They're nuts. <laughs> but watch. The person who tells you something very confusing is someone that you love deeply or someone that you are actually trying to be intentional with. You can't just let it go. You have to follow it. You have to pursue it. It's the difference between that weird guy at work telling you, I think I just saw Sasquatch last night. Watch this, to your spouse 
telling you, I think I just saw Sasquatch last night. One you can let go of, and maybe should, and the other you can't. See, I want you to catch this. When we read things in the Gospels that are challenging to understand, either because sometimes they're so base, some of Jesus' parables are like, and? Other times they're so confusing, and other times just kind of weird. To us, to the crowds, I, th- I will tell you, I think even to Jesus' disciples, this was just what? But I really want you to catch this. When Jesus says this, it's not because he's crazy. It's because he's absolutely purposeful. And he has said at the very beginning of this dialogue with the crowds, you've come, not because of the sign, like when I fed you lunch from a little boy's lunch, right, thousands of you, that was meant to invoke this sense of interest, meant to invoke this sense of awe, meant to invoke faith. But for many of you, it just invoked another hungry stomach the next day. And when they hear Jesus say weird things, because they don't have faith in him yet, that's going to set them on a course. But when Jesus' disciples, who I think were just as, huh? It's going to set them on a course too. One way that we do this, all right, this isn't the only place in the Bible that we go, that's hard to understand. It happens a lot in our own time with the Lord. It happens maybe in a a kind of following up a sermon. It happens in a Bible study. One of the ways that we do this and do this really well in a way that I just want to keep pushing out there is just going to be so incredibly helpful to you is we do this really well in community. Meaning this, when you read something from the Word of God that causes you to go, huh, and then you don't do anything more with it, When you read something from the Word of God, more importantly, when you read something on the internet about the Word of God, and just kind of go, that's really weird, and then read a couple more articles and a couple more, and you're just letting the internet tell you without ever going back to someone else and going, I just read this, what do you think about that? You see, God didn't just give us his word, he gave us a family. So we can bounce ideas off and go, let me think about that with you. Let's talk about that. One of the ways that we do that best is through our home groups, through our small groups, through the ways we actually have relationship with one another. Those are so important to us. They're one of our core values. Look upon the screen. <clears throat> we pursue spiritual growth and life change together in community. We pursue spiritual change and li- or spiritual growth and life change together in community. That's, that's why we do this. And, and what was so neat is that as we've worked with our elders and our directional team, we actually kind of amplified these core values. This is a, a fuller understanding of what we mean. From the beginning, Trinity Church prioritized small groups of people regularly gathering in community. We pursue personal and family growth by following Jesus' call to build up each other in sacrificial love. We offer a variety of small groups and focus teams where we meet regularly to love and encourage each other and to bear one another's burdens. It is in this rich community of doing life together that we experience God's love and grow in grace. If you're here today and you're not in a small group of any type, let me just tell you, you are missing out. You are missing out this opportunity, not just to understand the hard things of scripture, but when the hard things of life flow into your path. You are missing a committed group of people who will pray for you, who will love you, who will listen to you, who will crawl with you. Because that's what we do for each other. And it happens most effectively in those environments. Back to this hard saying, the best way I know how to understand this concept of what it means to eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood is that of how we find our sustenance, of where we look to for the nourishment that perpetuates life. Think of it this way, with your own physical body. I physically eat bread and drink fluids that keep this body going. Like the crowd's ancestors ate manna in the desert, I symbolically eat and drink, feed upon, feed from Jesus as I feed on his word 
that will keep my spiritual life going and ultimately lead me to eternal life. And Jesus said it earlier, the way, what his body, why his body is so important is that it's gonna be offered for the sin of the world, offering for atonement. By the way, when we would read this passage, some of us would walk away going, oh, this is what Jesus teaches. Jesus is teaching about communion. I want you to know, obviously, the parallels are huge. Today, we're going to receive communion ourselves. But as we do that, just know, I don't think this is Jesus' teaching on communion. When he does in the upper room, Jesus is going to make clear what the connections are to unique elements. And I think the disciples... As they're listening to Jesus, they're going to be drawn back to this conversation in John 6. But I don't believe Jesus is telling an unbelieving crowd or contentious religious leaders the the truths of communion yet. I think that's still to come, but the images are obviously incredibly connected together. This is what I think the disciples might have been thinking of this conversation in John 6 when this happened. Matthew 26, 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. If you're one of the disciples, just a year earlier, you heard Jesus say these things to the crowds out on that plane, or in the, this is in the uh, synagogue in Capernaum, you had to be thinking, oh, I've heard that before. Now Jesus is connecting some dots. Finally today, number three, be nourished by Jesus now and live forever. Be nourished by Jesus now and live forever. John chapter six, verse 57. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. I want you to note, catch this, we see again lots of words about life here, but I want you to see the progression. I want you to see the power of dependency. Look how it began. It says the living father. He doesn't just call him his father, the living father. And what does he say? He says, I live because of the father. And then finally, the one who feeds on me will live because of me. So see the chain, see the connection, see the dependency. The Father is, the, is alive. Jesus is alive because of the Father, and we who are nourished by Jesus live because of Jesus. You see this progression, these connections that are there of how ultimately we will have life. It's because of what the Father has done in the Son and what the Son provides for us. Now, when we're thinking about food and we're thinking about this idea of of this food chain kind of concept in this passage today, see how God's embedded this in our everyday lives. A living seed is planted into the ground and it sprouts to life. And then a wheat stalk begins kind of pushing through the surface and, and living wheat grain is on that stalk. It's made into bread. Bread is consumed and provides nutrients for life. This is not a great illustration for those of you who are gluten free. I apologize. But I want you to see this. God actually not just has embedded that in our normal lives. God something, said something really powerful about this. From the same prophet we looked at, interestingly enough, from the very next chapter, Isaiah 55, verse 10. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, to heaven, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. Look at this sentence. Why? What does the earth do so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater? Okay, this is the effect. Snow, rain, they come, they cause the earth to bud, and as a result, seed is available and bread is available. But watch, so is my word. He's making a parallel. He's using this as a symbol. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. What about it? It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for why I sent it. So if God's word has that kind of purposefulness, if God's word has that ability to go out and to do something active and to accomplish, how much more the greatest word he ever gave. John 1, 4, 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was, the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And watch, in Him was life. 
and that life was the light of all mankind. This is the bread. This is the bread. This is the better manna that Jesus is is saying that their ancestors had no access to because he had not arrived. This is something that will not leave dead bodies in the desert, but will lead us into life forever. So this week, this week in the midst of what you're facing, remember that Jesus says, I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. And in all the things that you're facing, which are many, and in all the things that you're praying, Jesus, please intervene and please fix this. Just know he's listening, but also know that what he came to provide was what you needed far greater than any of those problems. You needed hope. You needed forgiveness. You needed reconciliation. And he, Jesus, provided that offered his body so that you might be able to be reconciled, made right, because he took away your sin. That's amazing. That's the bread of life, and that's what he came to offer. But also know this, you have people in your relational world that you're praying for, that you're being influential with, and just know as they're hearing about Jesus, they might initially come to him like the crowds, so you're telling me there's lunch? That's okay. It begins with investigation. It begins by coming and seeing what the prayer is, what the hope is, what the influence is all about, that the people in your world would walk away with far more than lunch, that they walk away with life. This week, let's do this in this passage and every other one like it. When you're confused by something that Jesus said, keep going to the source for the answers. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today as a people that are so grateful that you came and did accomplish what we could never do, that you came to bring something that would satisfy far more than our physical appetites and hunger. You came and you brought what satisfied our souls. And what we desperately needed was not a physical nourishment, but a nourishment that would lead into eternity. Thank you that you met our greatest need. We come today today as a people who are thankful for that and who simply say, Jesus, help us keep coming to the source. Help us keep approaching you when we don't understand and help us as we pray to pray for more and be thankful for more than how you've worked in our circumstances, but the fact that you met this greatest need we had. You might be here today and in all honesty, you would say, Todd, I, I have not responded to Jesus that way yet. I've not responded in that kind of faith. I I can't honestly say that Jesus is the bread of my life. Then I have great news for you because right now, in this moment, that can change. When you you admit that Jesus, admit that you can't do this on your own, admit that you are a sinner who needs a savior, admit that these words that Jesus has said that you have a great need, be believe. Believe that Jesus is the only Savior available. He is the bread of life. See, choose. Choose to say, Jesus, I put my hope, my confidence, my trust, my belief in what you've done, not in what I can do. I want to live my life following your example. These ABCs can be your prayer today, and today, the 16th of May, your trajectory, your eternity can change. I pray you wouldn't let another moment go before you respond that way. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for these great words, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.